We're in a series on the book of Esther, and we've called this series Maximize Your Opportunity because Esther was thrust into an opportunity that she did not seek out. A lot of times we romanticize and we uh, make into a Disney movie the book of Esther, and we think that this was a beauty pageant that she wanted to enter. She was actually trafficked. She was actually taken from her home and forced into this competition to become the spouse of the king of Persia, who was the most powerful man on the earth. And that might sound like a pretty good deal, but she's only got a 1 in 300 to 400 chance of making it because there's all these others. Remember, it took her almost four years to get there to even meet the king. And so we're talking about the opportunities that are thrust upon us sometimes that God, uh, they start off as a problem. They start off as a conflict, and we have to find a way through that problem. Because if you remember from last week, in the book of Esther, God has never mentioned my name. Now, one time in the ten chapters of the book of Esther is God mentioned by name. Nor is there a miracle that occurs in the book of Esther. Everything is done with God working really behind the scenes. We sing a song here often called Miracle uh, uh, Waymaker, and it says that you're working even when I don't see you working. And that's the point of the book of Esther is God is at work. Because how many of you maybe this morning, you didn't feel revival in your spirit? Maybe you came here this morning and you're like, I just got here. I'm just glad I made it. Thank God I'm actually here. But God is still working. God is still at work in your life. God is still doing miracles in our path. Because there's three things that are happening in our world today. And this message, I'm going to get into the book of Esther. We're going to cover Esther chapter 2, 3, and the first part of 4 today. But it's going to be centered on this point that I want you to take home with you. Is that opportunity arises from conflict. Opportunity arises from conflict. Right now, there are three things I believe happening in the United States. I believe that there are three things that are happening. There's a greater push towards secularization in this nation than I've ever seen before. We can do it. We can be powerful. We can make things happen. And there's a mindset that's out there that there has to be revolution. There has to be change. And we're in a situation and in a world that's in conflict. The second thing is, I believe that there's a great revival and awakening taking place, but it's taking place among people who nobody ever thought would come to God. I believe that God is moving. I've been watching some of the, the moves. There's a, a guy named Mario Murillo who's been having tent revivals in California where church is basically shut down and people are getting saved off of the streets. So I believe there's a revival that is awakening among God's people that is going to be something different than what we've experienced before, but it's also going to be something like what happened with the Jesus movement where people are getting saved and they don't look like us talk like us or act like us and they make us uncomfortable a little bit but get over it we got to make room for them the third thing I see is there's a great falling away of religious people people who were attending church as a matter of fact they said that 33 percent of the people who were attending church faithfully before COVID will not come back so there's a great falling away because people, either for whatever reason, their love has grown cold towards God. And I was just scanning the headlines over the last few days, and I am grieved about what's happening in our world. When you look at the pandemic that just doesn't seem to go away, I don't understand why you got to get a shot and wear a mask. You look at the riots that are going on. You look at the political unrest. You look at the vandalism, the social injustice, the looting. I, I saw a video of a, a police officer in New Mexico who pulled a guy over for speeding. And the guy had a gun. And the police officer asked him to secure the weapon so that he felt safe. And instead of securing the weapon, he took it out and shot and killed the police officer. We hear about shootings in Indianapolis and San Antonio. It's almost like these mass shootings become an everyday occurrence and we just get used to it. It's just the way it is. We hear about people who are unarmed that are shot in, 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 because there's fear uh, of each other. 
There's a rapper who's marketing a tennis shoe right now. He, he took them from Nike. Nike had nothing to do with it. As a matter of fact, Nike's actually suing him. I'm shocked they're doing this. But a rapper took this tennis shoe, and he's calling them the 666 shoe and dedicating them to Satan. He's only making 666 pairs, and he's selling them for $1,000 a piece, and each one contains a drop of human blood in it. People are mocking and blaspheming the name of Jesus. There's an act that's going through, uh, just passed through Congress, and now it's got to go through the Senate before it goes to the president, called the Equality Act. And please understand, I believe everybody should be treated equal. But there's certain language in this bill. And I'm not trying to be political this morning. I'm just trying to tell you where we're at because we're going to find out where we are and how we're going to respond. Now, in this, in this uh, bill... It talks about that, you know, different things for the LGBTQ community. It talks about all these different things that are available. And everybody should have a right to live, a right to work, a right to make decisions for themselves. But there's language in there that says that it protects churches, it protects um, mosques, it protects uh, synagogues from uh, uh, hiring practices where you would have to hire someone who went against your beliefs. But it doesn't talk about public accommodation. When we open the doors of our church, we allow people to come in of every stripe, of every background, and we want everybody here. But if you tell somebody you can't use that bathroom because you were born a man, you could be in trouble because it doesn't provide for the church to do that. Now you say, well, pastor, you're getting into some political things this morning. That's not my desire. My desire is for us to see that we are in a situation in our country and in our world where Satan is doing his work, and if the church doesn't stay true to Jesus Christ, I'm not talking about trying to ban people from coming to church. I'm not trying to talk about, but about doing anything that would be uh, hurtful towards someone. But what I am talking about is this. I'm talking about the church of Jesus Christ actually being the church of Jesus Christ. See, this is the problem that we're facing. Is we are on a slippery slope towards things that could come back and end up being persecution. You say, well, that can never happen. Well, I imagine there were a lot of Jewish people that never thought that the king of Persia would want them annihilated. But that's what we're going to talk about today. In Esther chapter 2, verses 21 through 23, Mordecai, who is Esther's cousin who raised her. Remember, if you don't know the story, please read it. If you, if you want to hear last week's message, go online. It's at crosswind.org, or you can go to our YouTube channel, and it's there as well. And he goes, and she becomes queen, but es- Esther has Mordecai appointed to a, a, an opportunity. It says in the Bible that he was sitting outside the king's gate. And so sometimes we think he's just kind of goofing off. He's just sitting there, just relaxing. But that's not what it was. He's not poor. He's not begging. He's not just sitting there. He had an official capacity in his job. And he was there serving the king's needs. Probably because Esther had found a way to get him promoted when she had favor with the king. Now, while he's sitting there, two of the eunuchs, remember we talked about how people were taken into captivity, not just women, but men, and men were called upon to serve, and these men are serving in this place. And their names are Bigthana and Teresh. And these two men are angry with the king, and they decide they're going to kill him. And they're discussing their plans to assassinate him. And Mordecai overhears these plans, and he gets word to Esther. Esther tells King Xerxes, and King Xerxes, this is all going to be really important later on, so I've got to tell you this part right now. King Xerxes, he, he, he finds out about it, he investigates it, he finds out it's true, and he ends up having Big Thania and Teresh killed. For trying to assassinate him. And then we go to chapter 3. And in chapter 3 you would think. And Mordecai was the king's favorite person. And he decided to promote him and give him lots of riches. But it says the king didn't do anything for Mordecai. I mean hey if you guys are thinking about assassinating me. Somebody rat on him and I'll. uh, You can be associate pastor or something. Are are y'all awake this morning? So he got no promotion. 
But it talks about a man named Haman, and we don't know what this man named Haman did, but somehow he becomes number two in charge under Xerxes. And in this position, he's entitled to some things of recognition and honor and people bowing down to him in this opportunity he's been given. Now, church, what happens is Mordecai, who follows Jesus, and now the Bible doesn't, or he follows God, he follows Yahweh of the Old Testament, he doesn't bow down. Now, we don't know why, because obviously, if he ever saw the king, I'm sure he possibly bowed. And so it's not that he's worshiping these people, he's showing honor. It's like if I had a meeting with the President of the United States, I would probably dress differently than I would if I'm going to mow my yard. Just because of etiquette. But he refuses. He's the only one. And this makes Mordecai very angry. And so Mordecai goes to the king Xerxes and he says, he doesn't even tell him the name of the people group. He says there's a group of people who live in your kingdom who don't honor the king. Well, that's not true. Even Mordecai honored the king. But he says, they don't honor your ways. They don't honor your customs. They have their own weird customs. They pray to different, a different God. And we need to do something about them because they're causing problems. And he tells King Xerxes, if you will allow me to take care of this problem for you, I will give you 10,000 talents of silver. Now, when we hear that number, 10,000, we go, that's not that much money, right? Because we're used to like dollars, and we think $10,000, that's quite a bit of money, but it's not enough to eradicate a whole people group. Well, 10,000 talents is actually 375 tons. I want Mordecai's job. Uh, thank you, Haman, Haman's job. 375 tons. Do, do you understand? ton of weight 375 tons is 12 million ounces and silver is trading right now for $25.51 so he's offering to pay 306 million dollars and change to get rid of a problem when he only has a problem with one guy Church, if we think that the, the people in Iran who are followers of Jesus and the people of Afghanistan who are followers of Jesus or the people in China who are followers of Jesus are the only ones that are going to be persecuted, you better wake up and realize what's happening. And only those who will stay faithful and true to the kingdom of God and to the name of Jesus will overcome. Revelation chapter 12 verse 11 says this, They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. And the next part says, and they love not their lives even to the death. But Jesus is who I'm holding on to. Jesus is who I am committed to. I'm not giving up on him. I'm not giving in to the temptations of this world. In Matthew chapter 24, verses 10 through 14, listen to these words Jesus spoke. He said, and many will be offended. Many will betray one another and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Did you hear what I said? The love of lawlessness. The love of many will grow cold. Because we rise up and we decide that we can do things better without God. Because we rise up and we say, I don't need God. Or I only want God to be a part of my life once every six weeks when I go to church. We say these things and God says to us that your love is growing cold. Verse 13, he says, but he, listen to this, verse 13. He says, but he who endures to the end shall what? Be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations. And then the end will come. One of the toughest places on the planet right now to be a believer is Iran. If you're a follower of Jesus, you risk your life every day in Iran. But guess where the church of Jesus Christ is growing the fastest in the world? Iran. 
Why? Because when you find the truth and embrace the truth of God's love for you and his grace for you and his mercy, there's no other place you can go. But what's happened is we've been lulled into a false sense of religiosity here in our nation, that we are a blessed nation, that we are a Christian nation, that we honor God. And all those things are true, but we are slowly allowing it to erode. And the church is being awakened, I believe, today to say, I will stand with Jesus no matter what. In chapter 3, Verses 7 and 8, it says that Haman wanted to have the Jews eradicated. He wanted to kill those who offended him. Now, I don't know why he chose just to kill, to, to, not just to kill Mordecai who offended him, but he decided to wipe out this whole people group. And here's what happens is this people group uh, that, 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 are being wiped out. He, he goes to the, the counselors and he goes to these people and, and they actually cast lots to try to figure out when to do this. And so they plan a year in advance to wipe out the Jewish people. Now, logic would say, if I was Jewish and I heard about this, guess what? I'm moving. But how do you move when you got no money? How do you move when you're a servant? How do you move when you're a slave? You try, but you're still stuck. And so they heard about this, and they heard what was going to happen to them. In chapter 4, I want us to go there for just a moment. In chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, it says, And when Mordecai learned all that happened, he tore his clothes and he put on sackcloth and ashes and went out into the midst of the city. He cried with a loud and bitter cry. He went as far as front of the king's gate, for no one mighty might enter the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. And in every province where the king's command and decree arrived, there was great mourning among the Jews, with fasting, weeping, wailing, and many laying in sackcloth and ashes. What is the significance of this that I'm trying to make this morning? There's a conflict that has arisen. The people of Persia are going to be allowed to exterminate the Jewish people. They're going to be allowed to kill them. This decree is not re uh, reversible. Whatever the, the, the King Xerxes says is now law. And this law is in place. It's going to happen. And what do the Jewish people do? They begin to mourn. They begin to weep. They begin to cry. They begin to tear their clothes and put on old clothes and sackcloth, and they lay down on the ground. You say, well, what does all that mean? It means that they realized what was happening was not just a physical act against them, but it was spiritual. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but Jesus said, I've come to give you life, and not only life, but life more abundantly. Why did they take this posture? Why did they begin to cry and mourn and weep and pour out their hearts? Because here's why. The key in this passage, the key to getting the hand and the heart of God to move is repentance. Whatever the reason behind this, God was using these things as judgment. And we here in our nation are experiencing judgment right now that's being poured out because of man's wrath. People trying to divide us. People trying to separate us. People trying to, to do all kinds of things. People talking about the, the pandemic that, that is, is here. And it's real because I had COVID. Several people in this church have had COVID. I know it's real. But all of this is working together to cause an uprising. 
And all of this is calling upon you, where are you going to stand? Will you be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in Daniel chapter 3 that said, I will not bow to the idols of men. I will not bow to the gods of men. I will only bow to God Almighty. And the king Nebuchadnezzar said to them, he said, heat up the fire seven times hotter and throw them into the fire. and We'll see if they bow then. And they said, oh king, we have no need to answer you in this. Our God is able to save us out of the fire. But even if he's not able to save us out of the fire, if he choose to let us perish, let it be known. We will worship no other God but the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the God of Israel. I don't care who wants to be worshipped. I only worship one. His name is Jesus. But here's the problem that we seem to face here in our Western American culture is it'll get better. It's going to go away. We got a vaccine. We got this. And we don't realize that what God is doing is shaking us to awaken us to repentance, to a caring for the lost, to caring for the hurting, to get in these altars. We have these once a month revival now meetings, just once a month. And it's between the Spanish church and our church. And half of us, 75% of us, we don't even come. We don't even come. Are we hungry for God or are we not? Are you coming here on Sunday morning and give a clap? Or are you hungry and desperate enough that you'll cry out to him, that you'll fall on your knees and say, God, fill me with your Holy Spirit. God, I don't care what it takes. I don't care what I have to do to see you move in my life, God. I will pay the price because the people who are going to experience revival here in this nation, I believe, myself included, are going to have to pay a price. We're going to have to be persecuted. We're going to have to be willing to give up our lives. But we're going to also have to say, you know what, Jesus? I don't care what it takes. I will be in your presence. Worship went longer than normal this morning. That's okay. Because he's worthy of praise. He's worthy of worship. Sarah, thank you for being sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Pastor Devon, thank you for being sensitive. His agenda must be our agenda. And you note takers are looking at the notes going, he is nowhere on his notes. It's okay, that's why I printed them out for you. I'll get to them maybe. But right now I believe God is saying something to us Crosswind Church. It's time to shake off. The dust and the rust and the apathy. Because the number one problem I see in America today is we are apathetic in the church towards God. I don't want to be apathetic towards Jesus. I don't want to be dry and dusty. See, a lot of times people say, well, I came to church and I didn't feel anything. I came to church and I didn't get fed. My job is not to feed you. My job is to inspire you to go eat more. I didn't feel God because we didn't sing that song I like. We sang one I like today. I will bless the Lord. I will praise his name. Man, that song moves me. Why? Because it says I will bless the Lord. I will praise his name. But you got to decide what you're going to surround your mind with. It's amazing. I don't know what the culture was like. I wish the book of Esther told us a little bit more. But is the Jewish people, did they give in to the culture of Persia? Did they become more Persian than they were Jewish? And God said, i got to do something to awaken them out of their slumber. So I'm going to use this guy, Haman. To awaken them. What if, what if today, I don't think this is going to happen, but let's say what if our government decided that Christians are no longer going to be tolerated in the United States? What if they said that if you gather as believers, it'll cost you prison or it'll cost you your life or you'll have to start to pay property tax on your church? you imagine what the property tax would be on this property? We'd have to take up three offerings. 
and we'd all have to go do some other job or something. It'd be insane. What if? What if they said, it's going to cost you your life? Would you show up next Sunday? <coughs> I didn't feel too good, Pastor. I watched you online. <laughs> and if I showed up, I was afraid I wouldn't feel real good. <laughs> what would happen? What if someone asked you, are you a follower of this man, Jesus? Jesus. See, your inner circle needs to be people you trust. Xerxes listened to the wrong voice. The man who saved his life, listen to this, the man who saved his life, Mordecai, he rejected his voice. But he embraced the voice of the deceiver and a destroyer named Haman. Who you let into your world, who speaks things into your life, who speaks things into your heart, they better know this book. And if you're not receiving from this book, then you're receiving the lies. This is truth. This is truth. Let God be true and every man a liar. What are you surrounding your mind with? What are you surrounding your heart with? Protect that inner circle that you have in your life. Another key to having... A God-centered life is watch over the details. So what do you mean, Pastor John? If you read the story in chapter 3, Xerxes says to Haman, go and do with the people whatever you want. Keep your money. Do whatever you'd like. He didn't even, uh, wouldn't you think if somebody wanted to annihilate half of America? If, if somebody said to you, you were, let's say you're in charge, and they say, there's these people, they're causing you problems, and, and I want you to annihilate them. I want to annihilate them. Wouldn't you ask, well, who are they? Wouldn't you ask some questions? Wouldn't you say, well, well who are these people, and what are they doing? Wouldn't you ask a question or two? Instead of being like, no, yeah, go out and kill them. It's fine with me. I don't care. Keep your money. Man, you crazy if you turn down $306 million. You offer me $306 million, I'm taking it. <laughs> but here he is. This man, Haman, he, he's, he's, he's got the ear of the king, and the king's not even watching over the details, not even asking any questions. He puts his full faith and trust. Folks, it's okay to ask questions. It's okay to say, wait a minute, this is wrong. I don't stand for that. It's okay to take a stand for Jesus. We have to be prepared for evil attacks. There are evil attacks lurking around you every single day. I was thinking back to last September when Pastor Devon got COVID. He almost died. And I believe it was a spiritual attack against his life. Thankfully, through that process, they discovered that he was, um, was uh, diabetic and they were able to treat that. But most of us don't know that maybe, uh, I think it was two, three weeks after he got out of the hospital, he blacked out while he was driving and crashed his car. It should have killed him, but he walked away totally safe. And he stood on this stage and he said, Pastor, I believe it's because our church prayed. Our church interceded. See, folks, we don't know what's going to happen when we walk out those doors. We don't know what tomorrow holds. We don't know what this afternoon is going to bring. All I know is I trust Jesus to take care of me. But we have to awaken that there are attacks all around us. This past month, I've had uh, uh, some, some illness happen. I twisted my ankle. I hurt my back. I had all, it's spiritual warfare. The enemy trying to attack me. Yeah, I'm clumsy too. That has something to do with it. But there are spiritual attacks coming against me. Why? Because what I'm preaching to you today, the devil does not want you to hear. 
He doesn't want you to hear this because somewhere deep inside of you, the Holy Spirit is going to start stirring in you and you're going to awaken and say, you know what? I'm desperate for God. I'm hungry for God. I'm thirsty for God. I must have an encounter with Jesus Christ. I must be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. I must overflow with the anointing and grace of Almighty God. I don't want yesterday's manna. I want a fresh touch today. I want more of Jesus. I want more of God's power. And I'm not going to give up. They can say I won't make it. They can tell me that the commitment I made during Easter won't last. They can tell me that I'm not going to make it all the way through this thing. But here's the deal. I don't care what they say. I only listen to Jesus. So you have to prepare for a defense while executing an offense. Every night we say certain things with my son to get him into his spirit. And one of those things that we do is the armor of God. The armor of God is the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the sword of the spirit, the shield of faith, and the feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. That's the armor of God. Two interesting things about it. Number one, you have nothing for your back. Because you're not supposed to retreat. Let's talk about Christians going on a retreat. Let's go on a retreat. Let's have a men's retreat. Let's have a women's retreat. How about we have a men's advance and a women's advance and a going forward? I don't need to go back and lay down. I need to get up and rise in power. There's no armor for running away. The sword is the only offensive weapon you've got. And unfortunately in America, 90% of evangelical professing Christians have never read the Bible cover to cover. Never. How can you fight with something you don't even know the manual how to use? How do you stand in defense if you don't know your salvation? If you're not covered in that righteousness? You have to prepare for evil attacks. And even the most prepared person can have things sneak into their life. A few months ago, maybe I told you guys this, but we we really monitor what David's allowed to watch on TV. And so we make sure it's either educational or it's spiritual. But there are a couple of little shows because, you know, you want your kid to have a normal life. We don't want him just to, to, to not have any fun. And he loves Paw Patrol. How many of you got children or grandchildren that love Paw Patrol as well, yeah? Likes Blippy. And there was this new show. He likes monster trucks for some reason. I mean, he just loves. Any other kids? Is this like a weird phenomenon with my kid or is everybody's kid like monster trucks? Okay. So he, he likes these monster truck things. And, and so there was a show called Blaze. I don't know if you've heard about it. little monster truck show. And David was watching it, and we watched a few. It was like, oh, okay, it's all right. And then all of a sudden, we noticed he started waking up in the middle of the night screaming. He'd never done this before. He was always just calm, just always, you know, slept through the night. He's kind of like his dad. It doesn't matter where he is or what he's doing. He'll fall asleep if he's ready to go to sleep. And this little cartoon, we didn't think maybe, it, what, what's this, is there a connection here? He started getting more defiant. He get, get, began to get more rebellious. And one day, Milena saw that show was on, and Blaze or whatever turned into like a devil, or his friend that was in the show turned into a devil and started trying to cast a spell. And I said, Blaze, you get out of my house. We took the Blaze toy truck that he had. We threw it away. You say, well, it's just a cartoon. It's just a TV show. Let me tell you something. The enemy either will use one of three tactics in your life. He will try to deceive you that there is no God or that there's no worry of God or no fear of God needed in your life. He will try to seduce you with something that looks nice and something you enjoy and something that's, that's going to destroy you. Or he'll try to intimidate you with fear. That's only three ways he works. The devil doesn't have much of an arsenal. That's why we need the helmet of salvation to get rid of deception. That's why we need the breastplate of righteousness to keep us from seduction. That's why we need the shield of faith to keep from being intimidated by fear. So we threw out Blaze. Blaze is not allowed in our house. 
And after about a week or two, he slept through the night. He was back to being, excuse me, excuse me. If you know my son, if he wants to talk and you're talking, he'll say it 50 times till you stop and let him speak. Excuse me, Daddy, excuse me, excuse me. You've got to pay attention to what you allow in your house. One time, I know my time is, is coming close. Get, guys, come up here because we're going to have an altar ministry in just a moment. One time when we were in Texas, this girl called us and she said, Pastor, can you come to, our house, to my house? I've been seeing demons in my house. She said, I've been seeing all this stuff in my home, and it's scaring me. And, and we walked into this house, and when we walked in, there was a five-year-old little girl there, and she was just terrified. And she looked at us with these eyes that were just like, if looks could kill. I looked around the room for five minutes, and I went, I know what the problem is. This girl had gargoyles and dragons and demons and posters of dead celebrities on her wall. She, it was a complete house of darkness. And I said, I can't tell you what to do, but you need to cleanse this place, and you need to give your life to Jesus. Will you surrender your life to Jesus right now? She got down on her knees, and with me and my wife and my mother-in-law, we led her to Jesus right there in her home. She took and got rid of all those things, and every demon had to leave. you got to be careful what you allow into your life. Watch the details, folks. Watch what's going on, because the enemy will try to attack you, and Listen to this. This part was really fascinating to me. We're not going to get through all of this, but I started with the fifth point as the first point, so we're good there. Are y'all ready? Can you handle this? Is this good? All right. Esther chapter 3, verse 15, the very last verse. It says, The couriers went out, hastened by the king's command, and the decree was proclaimed in Shushan, the citadel. So the king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Shushan was perplexed. Was perplexed. Perplexed means that they were confused. They didn't understand. Why do they want to kill the Jews? Why, why would the king make this decree? Haman and Xerxes are kicking back with a few cold ones saying, hey, look what we did. But all the people are confused. People will wonder if the church in America comes under that kind of persecution. Even people that don't believe because they seem like nice people. They give out groceries to the hurting uh, every Tuesday. They, they, they seem like nice people. They're always saying, God bless you. You have to keep confusion out of your life. There's a lot of confusion in our world today. Wrong is right. Right is wrong. Holiness is optional in the church. We only have to believe. Well, the Bible says in James that the devil believes and he fears and trembles. Holiness is not an option, folks. I'm not talking about the legalistic holiness that I grew up in where women couldn't wear makeup or we couldn't watch TV or go to the movies, even though it would probably be a good idea to cut some of that TV and movies out and start listening to Jesus more. I'm not talking about legalism in the fact of trying to give an hour appearance. I'm talking about loving God with all your heart and keeping to the truths of his word. That's my passion. That's my desire. That's my hunger. And I want to know what kind of church I pastor today. I want to know what kind of people are here today. Are you hungry and desperate for God? Stand on your feet right now. All across this auditorium, stand on your feet right now and begin to give him some kind of praise. If you need to repent of something, the key to this is repentance. I would dare you to just come to this altar and lay it down. Whatever it is that you're holding on to you in your life, lay it down right here, right now. But right now, are you desperate for God? Are you hungry for God? Do you desire more of God today? Do you say, I'm not going to go back to the way I used to be. I'm moving forward. Do you say this morning, Pastor, I'm hungry. If you're hungry for God, get out of your seat. Lift your hand. Do something to say, God, I'm right here. I need you today. God, I want you today. Oh, Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come and wreck this place with your presence. Holy Spirit, come and have your way in this place. God, bring us to repentance. God, bring us to humility. God, bring us before your throne. And Lord, open up our hearts to be 
filled with Jesus. God, not ashamed of the gospel, not apathetic anymore. I break that stronghold of apathy now in the name of Jesus. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Restore unto me that passion that only comes from you, God. Oh, Lord, come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Come on. Don't be looking at your watch. Don't worry about what time it is. Get in his presence. Oh, Lord, we worship you, Jesus. Lord, we fall on our knees today. Lord, it's a sign of repentance, God. And we say, Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. If you've not been filled with the Holy Spirit, you've not been baptized in the power of the Holy Spirit, quickly get out of your seat. Come stand right here in the center. God's going to baptize you with the mighty power of the Holy Spirit right now. You say, I don't know what that is. Let me just tell you, it's the third person in the Trinity. He wants to immerse you. But if you want the Holy Spirit, come. Come right now. Move. Move now. Holy Spirit, I thank you that there's power in the name of Jesus. God, baptize my sister and fill her with the fire of the anointing of the Holy Spirit of God. Let the glory of God rest down upon her in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, fill her, God. Fill her, God. Helen, where's Helen? Helen, watch. Can you come stand behind her and pray with her right now? One of our elders. Holy Spirit, move in this place, God. We're not going back. We're not going back. Are you hungry? Are you desperate? Are you thirsty this morning? Are you tired of living the way you've always lived? And you said, Jesus, I want something different today. Oh, Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come in this place. Holy Spirit, come in this place. Holy Spirit, come in this place. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, overwhelm us today, God. Overwhelm us with your anointing. Let your Holy Spirit come. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. If you've been dry, hold up, hold up, guys. If you've been dry in your spirit, if you felt like there's just dust in your life, you don't feel God's presence, I am challenge you right now, He's here. But He wants to see some kind of action on your part. Father, we blow away that dry, dustiness, and we drink in the presence of the Holy Spirit today. If you're sitting here this morning, you're standing here this morning, you said, I've been empty, I haven't felt God, I've been dry, I've been in a place where I don't even know if God wants to touch me. Get out of your seat, come. Come here right now. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come come and fill your people. Lord, break off those things, Jesus. Break off those things, Jesus. Come on, Holy Spirit. Let the Holy Spirit move today, church. Oh, I'm not going back. I'm not going back. Awaken me, God. Awaken me, God. Give me a hunger for you. Give me a passion for you. Give me a thirst for you, Jesus. God, I die to myself today. Oh, come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. felt a strong impression in my spirit that there's somebody here this morning you're sitting in this section over here that your spirit has been crushed something happened to you that has crushed you it's crushed your ability to trust it's crushed your ability to have faith that God really loves you and cares about you it's crushed you God says, I want to take that out of you right now. I want to remove it from you. There's nothing you've done that separated you from the love of God. There's nothing that you've done that has disappointed Him so greatly that He's not willing to hold you again. 
And God just wants you to give that over to Him right now. Holy Spirit, do your work, God. Whatever God reveals, God wants to heal. Lord, lift the heaviness off of us, God. Say this with me. Jesus, I want more. I want more of you. Less of me. just sense of my spirit there's someone else here that your heart feels like it's been ripped in two that there's been like a slash it's almost like you feel like a sword was taken and cut your heart in two and I see the Holy Spirit just taking like a needle and thread and he's stitching your heart back together but here's the thing usually after stitches are removed there's a scar God's not even gonna allow a scar to be there anymore your heart's gonna be completely molded back together into the image that God created your emotions to be like. He is stitching it right now. And so you're gonna go through a process of a surgery, so to speak, but God is going to heal it and restore it completely. Thank you, Lord. Right now, Holy Spirit, do your work. Do your work. There's somebody sitting watching us online right now, and you're saying, I don't believe this is real. I don't believe God is even real. God says to you right now, where you're sitting, I just see him dumping his love on you right now. I just see a breaking. I see the Holy Spirit just flushing into your home right now, and he's transforming and changing your life. He doesn't care if you don't believe in Him. He believes in you. And He's going to make you believe in Him because of what He's about to do right now. In the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, overwhelm that person with your love and your grace. In Jesus' name. I titled this message, Opportunity Arises Out of Conflict. The conflict you're in has little to do with what's going on out there it has great to do what's going on in here the battles here the early church did not try to change the Roman Empire they tried to change individuals and as individuals got saved the Roman Empire changed to where whether it was out of pure motives or not within 300 years of the death and resurrection of Jesus Constantine abolished all idol worship and made Christianity the official religion of Rome you can't change things just through political ways you can't change things through the economic system you can't change things through education alone it has to be with the wind of the Holy Spirit and the conflict that you are involved in is this are you hungry for Jesus or are you just going to maintain status quo? That's the conflict. God wants to know where you're going to land. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. 